In this video, I'll talk about Linux users and groups. In Linux, users are the accounts, whether they're for people or for applications, that exist on the system. There are some reserved user account names that we can't use, such as root, LP, daemon, and so on. Users in Linux belong to one or more groups. And just as is the case with users, there are some common groups that already exist, such as LP, CD-ROM, SU-DO, and so on. Groups are normally used to give a common set of permissions to a set of users. This is much more manageable than assigning permissions for each individual user account. The default location when we configure a local user account in Linux is in the slash etc slash password file. Password is abbreviated as PASSWD, and it's just a standard text file. But notice this is for local Linux users. We can also configure a Linux system so that users can authenticate using a network account stored elsewhere. But for local Linux users, with their information in the slash etc slash password file, it contains information such as the login name, an encrypted password, which is often stored in slash etc shadow, the unique ID of that user account, a group ID for the default group that they are a member of, a reference to the user home directory, and also a default shell that the user will be presented with when they log in. For example, slash bin slash bash. Security user settings are found in the slash etc slash login dot defs file. User password and aging settings are stored in slash etc slash shadow. The shadow file is also a standard text file. Within that shadow file, each user has one line that contains the username, their encrypted password, the date of the last password change, the minimum number of days before a password can be changed, and so on. So essentially, in slash etc slash shadow, we have a lot of password aging information. We also have information relating to whether or not that user account is enabled or not. Groups are listed and assigned in the slash etc slash group file. Like the other files, this one too is a standard text file. Each group has the following items within the group file. A unique name a password, which could be assigned to the group, the group ID, which is a numeric value, and a comma-separated list of users that are members of that group. Some examples of default users and groups include the root user, which always has a user ID of zero. Most Linux distributions also have a group called root, which the root user is a member of, and that root group ID also is zero. The root user account has a home directory in slash root, and the default shell is normally set to a bash shell. But if we look at another account, for example, the daemon account, which is used to run some background daemons or services, it might have a user ID of two. It might be a member of a group of the same name with the same group ID, and it might have a home directory in a different location, such as slash sbin. And for shell, it might have an entry such as slash sbin slash no login, because this is not an account that can be logged into interactively. Instead, it would just be used to launch a background daemon. In this video, we discussed Linux users and groups. In this demonstration, I'll manage users within the GNOME desktop environment. We begin by going to the Applications menu in the upper left, and then we choose System Tools, and finally, Settings. In the Settings dialog box at the bottom in the System section, we see an icon called Users. I'm going to go ahead and click on Users. Here I'll see any existing user accounts, and here we have two, Cody Blackwell and Dana Powell. But I can use the plus sign in the bottom left to add a user, or the minus sign to remove a user account. So I'm going to click the plus sign, and I'm going to create a new standard user account. At the top, it defaults to creating a local Linux account, but I do have the option of creating an enterprise login where I specify the domain information for an account stored elsewhere. But I'm going to go back to local account. 
The default account type is set to standard for a regular user, but from that drop-down list I could select administrator. I'll leave it on standard. For the full name, I'm going to type in Julio Chavez. For the username, I'm going to modify it so it only results in J Chavez. Here, I'm then going to click Add to add that user account to the system. So we can now see we have an account for Julio on this local Linux system. But when I select that account on the left, on the right, in the details, I can see that the account is disabled. If I click on Account Disabled, I have a number of options available. I can set the password for this user now. I could choose the password at next login, log in without a password, and I could choose Enable this account. I'm going to select the option that says Choose Password at Next Login. And then I'll click Change. Over on the right, notice I can change the account type if I so choose in the future, perhaps from Standard to Administrator. I could set, select their login language, and so on. At this point, I'm going to select another existing user on the left, Dana Powell, and I'm going to remove that user account. To do that, when the account has been selected, in the bottom left, I would click the minus sign button. Here it's asking me if I would like to keep Dana Powell's files. So the user account will be removed, but what about the files in that user's home directory? I'm going to choose Keep Files. We may want to go through them to see if there's anything relevant. In this video, we learned how to manage users within the GNOME desktop environment. In this video, I'll demonstrate how to change a Linux user account password. The password can be changed either from the command line or in the graphical interface. We'll start at the command line. Currently, I'm logged in as the root user account, as evidenced by the result of the who am I command. I'm going to type su space dash space c blackwell to switch user to c blackwell. So currently, I'm logged in as a standard user. When a user wants to change his or her own password, he or she at the command line could simply type in P-A-S-S-W-D, at which point the system will prompt for the current password. Here I'll type in the current password for this user account, and I'll type in a new password. It will prompt me to retype the new password for confirmation. At this point, I get a message that says all authentication tokens updated successfully. This is good. It means the password for C Blackwell has been changed successfully. However, I'm going to type exit to go back to being logged in as root here in the command line. If root wanted to change the password for a user, perhaps a user, for example, forgot their password, the root account can do it by typing in P-A-S-S-W-D space and the name of the user account. In this case, let's say C Blackwell. The first thing that we notice is the root account doesn't have to have knowledge of the current password. It's immediately prompting for the new password. So I'll go ahead and supply a new password for the account. It tells me that it's a simple password. We're going to go with it anyways. And then it tells me that all authentication tokens were updated successfully. Now we can also change passwords within the graphical environment. Here in the GNOME desktop, I would go to the upper left and click on the Applications menu. Then I would choose System Tools, and then I would choose Settings. In the System section, we have an icon called Users. Not only do we work with user accounts here, but we can also set the passwords. So I could select a user, and when I do, the details become available on the right. For password, I could click on it, and I could set a password immediately. So I'll go ahead, and I'll select a password for user Julio Chavez. After that, I would click Change, and it's done. The password was set for that user. In this video, we learned how to change a Linux user password. In this video, I'll demonstrate how to work with the slash etc slash password and shadow files. Before we begin, I'm going to go to the Applications menu in the GNOME Desktop environment, under which I'll then choose System Tools and Settings. 
Here, I'm going to click the users icon where we can see we have two users created already, Cody Blackwell and Julio Chavez. If we take a look at the files where that user account information is contained, then we'll see additional info, including password, aging, and so on. Let's begin by using the tail command to view the last 10 lines of slash etc slash password. Password is abbreviated as PASSWD. This is just a standard text file that contains user account information for local Linux user accounts. The last two lines in our case have our users C. Blackwell and J. Chavez. The other user accounts are automatically part of this Linux installation. Let's take a look at user Julio Chavez here at the bottom of the slash etc slash password file. After the user account name, we have a delimiter, which is a full colon. The next field determines the user password. The small x means that the password is stored elsewhere, specifically in the slash etc slash shadow file. What follows next is a field that contains the unique user ID, followed by the group ID for the user's default group. That's then followed by a comment or a detailed description of the account, which is usually the full username. The next field after that is the location of the user home directory. And finally, the last thing we see here in the slash etc password file in the rightmost column is the login shell that the user will be presented with, in this case, slash bin slash bash. But recall that field number two indicates that the password is stored elsewhere. Let's use the tail command to view the last 10 lines of slash etc slash shadow. The shadow file contains things like the encrypted user password as well as password aging information. Let's take a look at the last entry here in the shadow file for Julio Chavez. The second field is the encrypted password for that user account. The field that follows after that is the last password change. It's the number of days that have elapsed since January 1st, 1970. After that, we have a value that indicates the minimum number of days that are required between user password changes. Following that, we have the maximum number of days where the password is valid. The next field to the right, here it's got a 7, is the number of days before the password is about to expire where the user will be warned. Then we have other options such as the absolute date when an account will be expired and can no longer be used. We can modify the contents of both slash etc password and slash etc shadow using a standard text editor or using a command line tool, or even a graphical interface. In this video, we learned about the slash etc slash password and shadow files. In this video, I'll demonstrate how to reset a user's password. There are a number of ways to work with user passwords. At the Linux command line shell, we can use the password command spelled P-A-S-S-W-D, followed by the name of the user whose password we wish to change. So here I'm going to type password space C Blackwell. Because I'm root, I don't have to have prior knowledge of the existing password for that user. It simply prompts me for the new password. So I'll specify a new password for the user. It tells me that it fails the dictionary check. It's based on a dictionary word. But I'm going to continue with this password anyhow, so I'll retype for confirmation. And then it tells me that all authentication tokens were updated successfully for that user. We could also use the known desktop GUI to set passwords by going to the applications menu in the upper left, down to system tools, and then choosing settings. Here, if we click on the users icon, we can also select a user and we can set the password over here on the right hand side of the screen. Passwords are stored in a file called slash etc slash shadow and they're stored there in encrypted form. Here I'm going to tail the etc shadow file to look at the last 10 lines. For example, if we look at user C Blackwell, we see that the second field, the delimiter is a full colon, contains the encrypted password. 
I'm going to type cat space slash etc slash shadow. And I'm going to pipe that to grep. And I'm looking for the root user account. Notice that for the root user account, much like with user C Blackwell, the password is in the second field. Now, what I can do if I have a forgotten root password is I can boot through alternate means, perhaps through a rescue disk. Then I can mount the root file system, which would give me access to slash etc slash shadow. For example, I'm going to use the VI editor to directly edit slash etc slash shadow. What I'm going to do is I'm going to delete the root user's encrypted password. So I'll press insert to go into insert mode. And I'm going to delete the encrypted password. So I'm going to delete everything up to the next full colon because the next full colon is the delimiter. In the bottom left, it tells me I'm changing a read-only file, but that's okay. I'm going to press escape. Then I'll type colon WQ. Now, if that's all I were to type in, in an attempt to write and quit the file, when I press enter, it would tell me in the bottom left that it's read-only. And I could use the exclamation mark symbol to override that fact. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'll type colon WQ exclamation mark. Now when I press enter, it saves the file. So if we use our up arrow key to go through our previous command line history to where I'm catting etc shadow for root, we can see in fact there is no longer a root password. For example, what I can do is switch to another terminal. Perhaps I'll press control alt F2 to open up TTY2 where it asks me to log in. Here I'll specify the username of root and I'll press enter. Notice it didn't prompt me for a password. And that's because I removed the password from slash etc slash shadow. Now, even though you might be able to boot through alternative means like a recovery disk and perhaps mount the root file system, that's not going to do you any good if the hard disk was encrypted. But in some cases, it's an extra safety net where we can go in and reset a root password that's been forgotten. In this video, we discussed how to reset a user's password. In this video, I'll demonstrate how to manage user accounts from the shell. Instead of using a graphical application to work with user accounts, we have various commands whereby we can add, delete, and edit users from the shell. For example, I'm going to use the user add command to add a local user account to my Linux system. So I'm going to type in user add space. I want to create a user account for user Jonathan Gold. So I want the username to be J Gold. I want to set the password here on the command line. So I'll use dash lowercase p and I'll specify the password. The next thing I want to do is use dash lowercase c to put in a comment or in this case, the full username Jonathan space gold. Now the user will log in with simply jgold. When I press enter, the user account is created. We can verify this by typing tail space slash etc slash password. The password file contains user account information on the local Linux system. And we can see the very last entry at the bottom is for our newly created user, Jonathan Gold. We can also see the system assigned a unique ID for that user, of 1003, it also will have created a group with the same name. We can verify this by typing tail space slash etc slash group. Notice this distribution of Linux also creates a group with the same name as the user. The group ID also is 1003. Back in the etc password file, we can also see our full username of Jonathan Gold and it also will have created a user directory under slash home called jgold. The default shell has been set for Jonathan Gold as slash bin slash bash. I'll type clear to clear the screen. We can also modify user accounts at the command line using the user mod command. Here what I want to do is change Jonathan Gold's login shell. Instead of slash bin slash bash, when Jonathan Gold logs in, I want him to use a C shell. 
So from the command line, I'm going to type user mod space J gold space dash lowercase s for shell space slash bin slash csh. That's the binary program that starts a C shell. I'll press enter and I'll use my up arrow key to go back through my command line history so we can view the tail or the last 10 lines of slash etc password. Notice that Jonathan Gold now has a shell set to slash bin slash csh. We also have the option of removing user accounts from the command line. This is done using the user del command to delete the user account. Here I'm going to type user del space j gold. Now I could use the dash lowercase r to remove the user home directory, but I don't want to remove that user home directory. I want to keep it around. So my command is very simply user del space j gold. When I press enter, the user is removed from the system. We can verify this by tailing the last couple of lines in slash etc password. Notice we no longer have jgold as a user account on the system. But if I were to type ls slash home, notice that we still have the home directory for jgold. In this video, we learned how to manage users from the shell. In this video, I'll demonstrate how to set user properties directly in slash etc slash password. On a Linux system, local user accounts exist in the slash etc slash password file. Here on my Linux system, I'll type tail space slash etc slash password. This will show me the last 10 lines in the password file. Indeed, we can see we have user account information. I'm going to use the user add command to add a user account for jgold. At this point, the user account has been created and we can verify that again by tailing slash etc slash password. However, what I'd like to do is directly modify this etc password file because I want to add a full username or comment for Jonathan Gold and I also want to change his login shell from slash bin to a C shell. Now I could do this using the user mod command to modify the user account but I can also edit the text file directly. To edit the text file directly, I'm going to type vi space slash etc slash password. Once in the password file, I'll press insert so that I'm in insert mode where I can modify the contents of the file. For jgold, I'm going to move to the fourth field where I'm going to type in Jonathan Gold. And I'm going to go to the end of the line where currently it has a bash shell set up for this user. And I'm going to change that to be CSH so it will start a C shell for that account. I'll type escape to get back to command mode in the VI editor. And I'll type colon WQ for write and quit. If we use our up arrow key to bring up previous commands, we can view the last 10 lines of ETC password again. Notice that our changes have persisted. We've now got the comment or description for that username, Jonathan Gold. We've also got a new shell that was changed. We can also do the same thing with slash etc group if we need to manually make a change to some property of a group. We could also do the same thing for slash etc shadow, where encrypted passwords and password aging information is also stored. In this video, we learned how to set user properties directly in slash etc slash password. In this demonstration, I'll configure password policy settings from the command line. Local Linux user account information is stored in slash etc slash password, but the password information is stored in a different file. It's stored in slash etc slash shadow. I'm going to cap that file and pipe it to grep because I only want to see the password information from the shadow file for user C Blackwell. Following the username here in the shadow file, I can see the encrypted password for that account, followed by a series of numeric values that represent password aging information, which we will explore in this demo. I'll start with the user mod command, which is used to modify an existing user account. I'll type user mod space C Blackwell 
space dash lowercase e space and I'll put in 8 slash 1 slash 2015. What I'm doing here is I'm setting the account expiration date for that user to be August 1st, 2015. But we can also use the password command, spelled P-A-S-S-W-D, to make changes to password policy settings. For example, I'm going to type password space dash lowercase e space C Blackwell. What this will do is it will force the immediate expiration of this user's password. And when I press enter, I get messages back on the screen to that effect. I'm going to type password space C Blackwell space dash lowercase n space 5. This numeric value, which I've set to 5, is the minimum number of days that must pass before a user can change their password again. I'm going to type password space C Blackwell, but this time I'll use dash lowercase x, and I'll put in space 30. What I'm doing here is setting the maximum password age in days. So this is the password change interval effectively. If I were to use the up arrow key to bring up the cat command, we can see for user C Blackwell that our changes have taken place. For example, we've got our numeric value of 5 here. That's the minimum number of days that must go by before the user can change the password. And we've also got our 30-day password change interval listed here. I can also specify in number of days a user warning before their password expires. For example, I'll type password space C Blackwell space dash lowercase w space 2. This means that two days before the expiration of the password, the user will be warned about this fact. In this demonstration, we learned how to configure password policies from the command line. In this video, I'll demonstrate how to manage groups. Linux user accounts must be a member of at least one group, and that's called the primary group. But users can also be members of multiple groups. Group information in Linux is stored in the slash etc slash group file. When I cut that file to display its contents, we get a list of all the groups on the system. In the leftmost column, we have the name of the group. In the second column, if there's a lowercase x, it means there is no group password. Group passwords are rare. Of course, user passwords would be common. The third column is the unique group ID. The group ID is a numeric value that uniquely identifies the group on this Linux system. I'm going to clear the screen with the clear command. Then I'm going to create a group by typing group add, which is one word. I'm going to type group add space HR to add a human resources group. I'm then going to use the tail command against slash etc group to show me the last 10 groups. At the very bottom, we can see our newly created group, HR. There is no password set, so we've got a lowercase x in the second column, and the system automatically assigned the next sequential group ID number of 1005. We can also make changes to groups. For example, I can use the group mod command. What I'm going to do is type group mod space hr space dash n. Now the lowercase dash n lets me set a new name. So in essence, I'm renaming a group. So instead of HR, I would like it to be called Human Resources, all spelled out one word. If I tail the ETC group file, indeed, we can see the change has taken. We can also delete groups from the command line using the group del command. Here I'll type group del, and I notice I have a group here called sales. I want to remove that group. So my command then is group del space sales. If I tail the etc group file, notice we no longer have a sales group. In this video, we learned how to manage groups. In this video, I'll demonstrate how to add users to groups. Most administrators will commonly put users into groups to facilitate granting permissions to those groups to resources such as files, directories, websites, and so on. It's important to have a standard naming convention in place within the organization before creating groups. 
Group information in Linux is stored in the slash etc slash group file. So here at the command line, I'll type cat space slash etc slash group, and I will pipe that to grep, and then I'm looking for human resources. When I press enter, I see information only for the human resources group from within the group file. So the leftmost column has the name of the group, in this case, human resources. The second column has a small x because there's no group password. And then I see the group ID, in this case, 1005. Then at the end, I have a full colon. So there's nothing at the end, which means there are no members within the human resources group. Well, we're going to change that. We're going to do that by typing user mod, and I want to modify user account C Blackwell, and I'll put in dash capital G, followed by the name of our group that we want to add the user to, in this case, human resources. Now I'll use the up arrow key to bring up our previous cat command, and we can clearly see now that user C Blackwell is a member of the human resources group. Let's go ahead and add another user. I'll type user mod space J Chavez dash capital G and then I'll put in human resources. If we cat the group file again, we can see now the human resources group has two members, C Blackwell and J Chavez. You can also add the user to more than one group on a single command line. Here's how to do that. User mod space. We'll pick a different user this time. How about J Gold? space dash capital G. So I want to add J Gold to the human resources group as well as the sales group. So on the command line after the dash capital G space, I've got human resources comma sales. Now what I'm going to do is tail slash etc group to show me the last 10 groups. And we can see indeed that user J Gold is a member of both the sales group as well as being a member of the human resources group. In this video, we learned how to add users to groups. In this video, I'll demonstrate how to modify a user's default group. In Linux, every user must be a member of at least one group, and that group is called the default or primary group. The purpose of the primary group is such that when a user creates a new file, for instance, that user account name is listed as the owner of the file, but the user's primary group is listed as the owning group related to that file. We'll explore that further in this demo. Let's start by adding a user account called J Chen. I'm going to do that by typing user add space J Chen. Then what I'll do is use the cat command space slash etc slash password I'll pipe that to grep because I only want to see the user account information for J Chen. I'm interested in the third and fourth columns. The third column has a numeric value of 1004 for user account J Chen. This is that user's unique ID. But the fourth column, the next one to the right, has also the same numeric value, 1004. That references the default or primary group ID for user J Chen. To explain this properly, we really need to take a look at slash etc slash group. I'm going to type cat space slash etc slash group, pipe grep, and again I'll grep it for Chen. Now here in the group file, we've also got a group called J Chen that has an ID of 1004. Well, that's kind of weird. Well, actually, it's not. Many Linux distributions work this way. When you create a user account like we did for J Chen, it will create a group of the same name, and the group ID will be the same as the user ID. That is that user's default or primary group. But we can change it. That's done using the user mod command. What I'm going to do is I'm going to type user mod space J Chen space lowercase g space sales. What this means is I am changing J Chen's default or primary group to a group called sales. Now be careful, I'm using a lowercase g to change the user's default group. If you mistakenly use an uppercase g, then you're simply adding that user to an additional group. You're not changing their default group. 
Now I'm going to use the up arrow key to bring up our cat command where we were viewing Jay Chen's account information in the password file. You'll notice that in the fourth column, we've now got a different group ID of 1006, where previously it was 1004. Let's use the up arrow key again to view the contents of the etc group file for the group for Chen. Now that still had an ID of 1004, but that's no longer the default group for user J Chen. I'm going to type tail space slash etc slash group. You'll notice that we have a sales group here and that its ID is 1006. So clearly we've changed J Chen's default group to be the sales group. Let's see how that plays out. Currently, if I type in the who am I command, it tells me I'm logged in as root. I want to switch over to user J Chen. So I'm going to type SU, that's the switch user command, space J Chen. Now what I'm going to do is type PWD, print working directory. Currently, J Chen is in the root directory. So I'll just type CD enter to go to that user's home directory. If I type PWD again, we can see we're now in slash home slash J Chen. I'm going to use the touch command to create a new file called new file. If I type ls l space new file, we can see that J Chen is the owning user of this new file, but that J Chen's default group, which has been changed to sales, is the owning group related to that file. This means that the user, J Chen, gets the user permissions, in this case, read and write, and members of the sales group will get the group permissions, in this case, just read. In this video, we learned how to modify a user's default group. This exercise deals with updating system software, as well as with the creation of groups and users and setting file ownership. Specifically, in this exercise, you'll begin by updating system software with the Linux yum command. Then you'll create a group called ProjMGRS, that's Project Managers, and then you'll make a user called mjones, and you'll put mjones in the Project Managers group. Then, in the root of the file system, you'll create a directory called Proj Files, where you'll set mjones as the owner, and you'll set directory permissions to allow writing for anyone in the Project Managers group. Now pause the video and attempt these tasks and then afterwards come back to see some possible solutions. Okay, so what follows are some possible solutions to the exercise tasks. The first thing we needed to do was to update system software and we can do that by typing yum space update. It's going to take a look at my installed software packages, then it's going to check my configured repositories to see if there are any updates. Then it will prompt me, which it is doing now. I'm going to type N for no. I don't want the updates applied at this point. We then needed to create a group, and this can be done using the command group add. So I'll type group add space proj mgrs. That creates the project managers group. Then I'm going to add a user with the user add command called mjones. To put mjones in that group, I'll type user mod space mjones dash capital G space proj mgrs. So I'm putting mjones in the project managers group, but the project managers group will not be the primary or default group for mjones. If I wanted to do that, I would have to use the lowercase g switch. At this point, what we need to do is make a directory, so I'll type make dir in the root called proj files. Now I have to have permissions to do this where I'm logged in as root this isn't going to be a problem. Now, after that directory has been created, I want to set mjones as the owner. To do that, I'll type chown to change the owner, space mjones, space proj files. I'll check my work by typing ls-ld space proj files. And we can see now that user mjones is the owner of that directory. The last thing we have to do is to set permissions on the directory to allow writing for anyone in the project managers group. That means we're going to change the group associated with the directory. To do that, I'll use the change group command. And I want to change it 
to proj managers and I want to do that for the proj files directory. I'll bring up the lsld command again and we can see now that project managers is listed as the group associated with the proj files directory. Now we need to make sure that they have right permissions. So I'll use the change mode command, chmod. Here I'm going to do it for the group. I'll type g and I'm going to add write, so I'll type plus w. This is going to happen for the proj files directory, so I'll have to specify that, of course, on the command line. I'll use the ls command to check my work. We can now see that the project managers group is listed here and that they have read, write, and execute permissions. In this exercise, we updated system software, worked with users and groups, and set file ownership.